and welcome back to CEO.ca's Inside the Boardroom. Today, I'm excited to be discussing the updated preliminary economic assessment from Orocco Resource Corp. And who better to talk to than Adam Smith, Vice President of Business Development. Adam, great to talk to you today. And good to be here, James. Thanks very much for the opportunity to tell investors about this important update for Orocco. Yeah, so let's get right into it. Big milestone. You know, it's been a long time coming since October that the last PEA. Can you walk us through what are some of the key updates and what does this update mean for investors? Thanks, James. Uh, so when we published the, the mineral resource estimate uh, and PEA last year, uh, we realized immediately, immediately that there were some uh, opportunities to add value to the project. Um, there were some opportunities to, to make some changes to the mine plan. Uh, and other aspects of the project uh, and realize some some gains in in the metrics like NPV and IRR. Uh, we have done that. Uh, we have today published results that we're very pleased with. Um, and primarily uh, as a consequence of, of optimizing the uh, the initial build out of the mine, the expansion, ultimate expansion of the mine, uh, prioritizing higher grade in the in the early years through the mill, uh, we've realized significant gains. Uh, we've increased the, uh, the pre-tax uh, NPV to almost 2.6 billion. Uh, we've increased the post-tax um, NPV to about 1.5 billion, increase of, of almost 250 million. Uh, and we've done that while simultaneously reducing the capex of the project by, um, <clears throat> by over $300 million to 1.1 billion. Um, Life of mine revenue at Santa Tomas is, is approximately $22 billion. Uh, annual revenue at the base case metal prices is almost a uh, billion dollars. In fact, at today's copper prices, <clears throat> which are slightly higher than the base case, um, annual revenue at Santa Tomas would be uh, would be a billion or, or exceed a billion. So we, we realized the gains that, uh, that we want to. Um, some of the metrics, some of the important metrics like NPV over CapEx, for instance, place Santa Tomas uh, among the highest uh, in its peer group. Um, and today's results establish Santa Tomas as one of the world's most capital efficient, large scale, low cost copper mines. Thank you very much for that overview, Adam. And I think uh, it's you know a very exciting update for investors. I would love to wind back the years. Obviously today, a big milestone with this updated PEA, but can you give us a sense of you know, what work has gone into developing this project in years prior? Certainly. So we initially got involved in Santa Tomas uh, approximately 2009. Uh, what followed was a very long land assembly process uh, where we were able to put together not just the historical discovery at Santa Tomas, but land constituting all possible uh, expansion, uh, all possible extensions of the mineralization that made up that uh, initial resource. From January of 2020, that process uh, completed. At, at its core, there was a legal battle. Um, uh, that was completed in January of 2020. And since then, we've raised approximately uh, $80 million. Uh, we have established a, a large functional infrastructure at Santa Tomas that consists of a road network, water distribution network, uh, core handling and storage facilities, workers camps, um, and uh, a head office in the town of, of Choix. Uh, we conducted a 3D IP program, one of the largest uh, at the time, 14 square kilometers, uh, as well as then uh, 49,000 meters of core drilling at Santa Tomas. Uh, we drilled approximately five kilometers of strike length of mineralization, uh, identifying continuous mineralization along that five kilometers. We focused on three and a half kilometers of north-south strike length at Santa Tomas and ultimately came up with a resource of uh, well over a billion tons, uh, almost nine billion pounds of, of copper at Santa Tomas. Uh, the pre preliminary economic assessment followed, the update followed, uh, and today I think uh, we've established Santa Tomas um, as, as one of the, the relatively few major discoveries uh, of a significant copper asset uh, in the last five or 10 years. Um, by significant, I would suggest uh, the production over 100,000 tons of copper and, and equivalent per year would, uh, would qual qualify it as that. Um, our average production over the 22.6 years identified in this PA uh, is approximately 108,000 tons of copper and equivalent in concentrate. So we, we've taken a project uh, in 2009, um, advanced it from an ownership and land title perspective until January of 2020. And since then, we've, uh, 
we've advanced it from a geological and engineering perspective uh, to the point today where it's uh, one of the, the relatively few big assets of its kind uh, that's been identified in the last uh, several years. Excellent. Thank you very much, Adam. And I think you know, when you're operating on a project of this scale, obviously very complex and, and a lot of work going in over the years, can you give us a sense of now that this updated PEA is out, what comes next you know, through year end? And then if we look a little further ahead, you know, five years down the line, where do you expect the project to be then? So today's results uh, place Santa Tomas among the most capital efficient projects. Um, for example, uh, CapEx per unit of annual production, um, capital initial capital per uh, ton of annual production uh, is identified as approximately $10,000. That compares to, for instance, uh, BHP's recent bid for Anglo uh, valued the copper assets uh, at approximately $35,000 per ton of, of annual production. There's been some other M&A recently, which, uh, which uh, has taken place at level, similar, similarly high levels. So we've established Santa Tomas as a very, very efficient, low cost, high producing asset. Uh, the ratio of NPV to, uh, to CapEx, for instance, is also uh, uh, among the highest of its peer group. I think that's that's been uh, now that that's been established. I would expect that we're going to get uh, significant incoming interest from from investors, whether it's individual retail investors or major investors or even a strategic investor. Um, our job now is to continue the program, the drilling program, the exploration program at Santa Tomas elevate this PEA to a higher level, perhaps a, a PFS, perhaps a, an additional PEA. Uh, there's drilling to be done at Santa Tomas. Um, we have a gap between the two zones where historical drilling has identified mineralization. We did not uh, drill in that area or drill in enough detail in that area to, to create a resource, but there's an opportunity there to find additional mineralization within the pit, uh, increase the overall production and lower the strip ratio. We've also identified mineralization outside of the ex existing pits through our prior drill program, as well as uh, uh, identified over 200 million, 250 million tons uh, of mineralization through our drill program uh, that was not incorporated into this drill plan. So there's a number of opportunities to uh, expand Santa to mass, make it either a longer life mine or a higher, uh, uh, higher level of annual production or both. So we will, we will do that. Uh, as well as uh, liaise with local community, local uh, the state uh, political apparatus uh, to advance uh, what we already have there, which is the support both of the local population uh, as well as state politicians for Santa Tomas. Thank you very much for that overview, Adam. Now, I understand there's a new government incoming in Mexico. Can I get your thoughts on what you're expecting in terms of attitudes and, and friendliness towards mining companies? Certainly. Well, uh, James, we're optimistic that President-elect Scheinbaum uh, will follow through on some of the early signals that she's she sent. Um, she is a climate scientist. Uh, she is looking forward to moving Mexico towards uh, a greater percentage of their energy coming from renewable energy. She has very specifically mentioned the need, therefore, to develop lithium and, and copper assets uh, in that effort. Um, and she has made some appointments of, of ministers uh, she doesn't take power until October 1st, but some of the early appointments are promising. Uh, she has appointed pro-business, pro-foreign investment, even pro-mining uh, ministers uh, to her cabinet. Uh, we think she'll continue Mexico's tradition of being one of the world's mining powerhouses. Uh, it's a top producer of it's the top producer of copper or sorry, it is the top producer of silver. Uh, it is a top 10 producer of a host of other metals. Um, and we think that that strong, enduring culture, a pro-mining culture, um, will uh, will come through in the Scheinbaum administration, uh, and we will see the great potential uh, in that industry uh, be realized. It, uh, it comprises up to 4% of, of the economy, a fact that uh, President-elect Scheinbaum recently mentioned. Um, it provides uh, investment opportunities, job opportunities, um, in rural parts of Mexico. Uh, so we think it, uh, we think that uh, Mexico will continue as one of the world's mining powerhouses and that will be manifested under uh, a pro-mining regime uh, under President Scheinbaum. 
Absolutely, and I'm sure lots of other companies are waiting to get those, uh, that clarity from the next administration as well. I want to talk a bit more about the copper markets. You know, it's been an exciting year. We've had copper briefly touch $5 a pound. We've had some headline M&A with Philo Mining. What's your perspective on the current state of the copper market? The current copper market, James, is very interesting. Um, several years ago, when renewable energy and the importance of, of copper in that started to be discussed, copper use has, has grown consistently during that time and grown for the right reasons. It, it's grown because of its increased need uh, in a renewable energy environment. Uh, more copper is consumed in the generation of electricity, the transmission of electricity, and the ultimate use of that power um, than in the fossil fuel um, energy regime. So we've seen consistent growth for the reasons that were predicted. Uh, last year, uh, investment in renewable energy uh, for the first time exceeded investment in fossil fuels. Uh, we think that will continue. Uh, there's a massive amount of, of solar, wind, uh, and electrification in the works right now. That's been noted by the New York Times when they, they declared that the, the renewable energy future is coming at us faster than you think. Um, Bloomberg said there's a mind-bending uh, amount of, uh, of solar energy um, in the works for the United States. Um, we know that China has invested a great deal in renewable energy and copper-intensive technologies. Uh, the European Union, the United States, and China have all put uh, incentives in place for copper-intensive infrastructure and renewable energy and electrification. Uh, going forward, we expect copper use to, to increase for that reason, uh, as well as a, a host of new uh, copper growth opportunities that have appeared, uh, whether it's faster than expected growth, uh, growth in the, the double digits of copper use in India, uh, or artificial intelligence uh, and the huge amount of copper that's needed in that, uh, that computing environment. So, we're now consuming somewhere in the high 20s um, of millions of tons of copper per annum. We expect that figure to rise to 40 plus million tons uh, within a decade. That's a very exciting story, but the supply side is, is no less exciting, at least for those who uh, have uh, invested in, in copper or own big copper assets like, like Oroco. Um, the rate of discovery of new cap copper assets has been declining since the year 2000, since 2010. Uh, declining very, very rapidly. Uh, in the last several years, we, we really have very, very few material discoveries uh, in the copper world. And we're at a, at a point in time where uh, a great deal of the world, world's copper production resides in aging copper mines uh, whose production is forecast to decline in the, in the coming decades. So we have a very exciting demand-driven story um, and a no less exciting from the perspective of owners of, of copper assets uh, tightness of supply issue. Uh, for that reason, copper prices are expected to, to rise. Uh, some of the forecasts are for rises 50% or more from, from today's prices. And what that suggests for owners of assets like ours uh, is you have a number of ways to, to gain on your investment in a copper asset. Um, in our case, we, we are trading at about 5% uh, or even less than 5% of the net asset value as, uh, as determined by this PEA. Uh, M&A takes place somewhere between 40 and 50, even 60 percent of, of NAV and above. So there is a potential large gain for investors in the event of acquisitive interest uh, for our company, um, as well as the leverage that our asset provides to provides to to rising copper prices. For every percent copper prices rise from our base case of four dollars used in the PA, four dollars per pound of copper, um, the net asset value rises by about 3.6 percent. So a 10% rise in copper prices to 440 leads to an increase in our net asset uh, value from about a uh, little under 1.5 billion to 2 billion. Uh, at $5 copper, which we saw just a, a few months ago, the net asset value of Santa de Mass rises by 90%. So uh, I like to think that if copper prices stay where they are and we see acquisitive interest, there is uh, a big opportunity for investors to see higher valuations in Rocco. But if we see that together with a rise in copper price and an increase in net asset value, and therefore a re-rating uh, uh, re of, of what a M&A transaction could take place at, uh, investors have a second way to win. So you've got leverage to copper prices. Uh, you've got the M&A uh, re-rate that is possible for companies and assets like ours. 
um, as well as um, I think uh, the potential for assets to, to trade at higher valuations than historically, uh, simply because of the scarcity of them. Absolutely some compelling fundamentals there, both on you know, the, the macro side in terms of uh, supply and demand, but also in terms of that leverage, as you mentioned, to the copper price. I guess when investors are looking at opportunities in the copper sector, why do you think they should be paying attention to a story like Oroco and why is now a good time to get involved? With the completion of the PA, with with the, its establishment of Santa Tomas as one of the world's low cost, most capital efficient, uh, big potential producers, uh, I think we've opened the door for acquisitive interest in, in the company. Um, we also have the possibility of a re-rating as the uh, environment in Mexico becomes clear. And we've got the potential uh, to increase the value of the asset simply through exploration. Um, so we know what Oroco provides to investors, and we know there's multiple ways for, for re-rating of the share price. Um, and I think uh, an investment in, in an equity versus some, some other method, like the physical metal, for instance, um, has historically provided greater returns, greater leverage to investors. Um, usually it's 3, 3.5 to 1. In our case, that's exactly the, the ratio of um, uh, rise in copper prices to rise in net asset value that, that we provide. So um, I, I think you, you get greater leverage, quite simply, by investing in a copper equity. Uh, a copper junior like Oroco, already trading at uh, such a discount to its net asset value, uh, provides a very asymmetrical uh, opportunity in terms of downside versus versus upside. Well, Adam, congratulations on putting out the recent PEA and looking forward to more updates from Morocco throughout the year. Thanks again for joining us. Appreciate it. Look forward to uh, speaking to you again when, there, when there's a material update. Thank you, James. Thank you.